Okay, hello everyone. I'm Monica, if you don't know me. My name's Monica. There you go. Um, so today, we're going to um, take a look at the story in the life of Stephen um, in the book of Acts. So um, that's kind of where it will be today. And I will start us off with prayer. And then we'll just, we're just going to be reading scripture today. That's pretty much what we're doing. Okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pray and then we'll get started. Lord, thank you for um, the people gathered in this place tonight. And I pray that your word would be um, spoken, that it would be settled on our hearts and our minds. Lord, that um, you would keep it close to us and that the spirit would enable us to walk it out. And I pray that um, tonight that this part of scripture would just jump off the page as it did for me. And I pray that we would all be changed by your word and by your spirit, not just tonight and by this message, but every day as we walk closer and closer in our walk in relationship with you. And I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Okay, so um, I hope you had a good Easter. Hope it, hope it went well. I love Easter. Easter is always so great. We are big, big, you know, we're big Easter fans in my house. My mom loves Easter. It's her favorite holiday. So uh, we always went all out as children, did the eggs, did both the colored, like, finding the eggs and, like, the Jesus eggs, where, you know, you had, like, the specific carton of eggs that told, like, the gospel. That was my family, okay? So um, I'm a big fan, and so I hope that you enjoyed Easter, too, and that uh, you got to spend it either with family or, if you stayed here in Hayes, that you spent it with a church here um, and got to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, eh? Woohoo! Okay, so <laughs> that was very enthusiastic. Wow. Um, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so coming off of Easter, I thought that this would be a great chance for us to kind of talk about the very beginning of the church and how God spread the gospel in the months and years after Jesus' ascension. And I've been reading Acts in my own personal Bible study, and I was reading this story a couple days ago, and I was like, wow, it's like I've never read the Bible before. Um, I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments where you're like, I know I've read this passage probably six times, but I've just never like, seen this story in this light. And so that's kind of what happened to me the other day, and so I wanted to share that with you, because what better thing than to share how God is speaking to us, right? So... Um, I wanted to talk about the beginning of the church and how uh, the gospel spread quickly and like fire. And that while our first inclination is probably that that was, you know, through the apostles and like a lot of it was because that's what Jesus called them to do himself was called them to spread the good news um, around the world. But as the church begins to grow in the first couple chapters of Acts, we see thousands of people come to Christ at a time like in one evening, okay, kind of thing. So it's spreading like wildfire. And all of a sudden, the church is no longer the small group of people who followed Jesus while he was here on earth. It's growing by the thousands. So as the church is growing, we uh, get the first picture of what it looks like for the church to serve their way to evangelism and to fulfill the Great Commission, okay? So we're gonna be reading through Acts chapters 6, a little wee bit of seven and a little wee bit of eight, okay? So since we're kind of going to be a little all over and a lot of our time is going to be spent reading, um, if you have your Bible, pull it out. If you don't have your Bible, pull out your phone because I didn't put it up here. So those are your two options or you can listen to me read, but I don't guarantee that I won't stumble a lot. So heads up. Um, if you have the Bible app on your phone and you want to switch to the same translation that I'm going to be reading, I'm going to be reading the NLT. So if you don't have the Bible app, this is a shameless plug. If you want to download it, uh, it takes like 10 seconds, okay? And then you can read the Bible wherever you are. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and start chapter 6. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained that the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 called a meeting of all believers, and they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so brothers, select seven men who are well 
respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them their, this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea and they chose the following. S Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Philip, I'm gonna butcher all of these names so I'm just warning you right now. Prochorus, Nicanor, Timian, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they, and they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, or freedmen, which might be in your translation, as it was called, started a debate him, with him. They were Jews from Citrine, Alexandria, and Silica in the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit in which Stephen spoke. So they, pers so they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, we heard him blasphemy Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders, and the teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The lying witnesses said, This man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say this, This Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Then the high priest asked Stephen, are these accusations true? This was Stephen's reply. So I'm not going to read all of chapter 7. Okay, we're going to jump because Stephen gives a sermon here, all covering the rich and compelling story of the Old Testament leading to now, where they were in the very beginning of our New Testament, seeing that Christ has resurrected. Okay, so he takes the um, Jewish leaders through the Old Testament, talks about the prophets, and he talks about um, how the Jewish leaders have now killed the Messiah. And he states over and over again how the Jews have turned away from God and rejected those that he sent to them, and eventually the case for those accusing them now, rejecting the Messiah himself. So we're going to jump forward to chapter 7, verse 54. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation and they took their, shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing at the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the place of honor at God's right hand. So they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him and they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all believers except the apostles were scattered through the region of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging both men and women to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. That's where we're going to stop. So, that's the story of Stephen, pretty much beginning to end, okay? So, Stephen's ministry was very short, and I feel like if Stephen's story tells us anything, it's that it doesn't really matter how long a person's ministry is, God can use it for his glory. It was like that, okay? This was his only recorded, ministry, recorded uh, message and sermon, if you want to call it a sermon, but it was incredibly impactful. It was one of the most impactful in church history, all because Stephen was first chosen to serve. So Stephen wasn't like a deacon because that really didn't come into play until a little bit later, and he was, but he was in charge of serving the tables and caring for the widows. And whether that was like him physically being there taking care of the widows 
or if it was more of an administrative role, it doesn't really matter because either way, he was given a functional task in the community of the church. He was not an apostle, but he performed signs and wonders. He was not a prophet, but he was a great preacher. Stephen was a servant, just as Christ was a servant, serving and meeting the needs of his people. So why did God call Stephen to serve? He seems like a very grand man, so why, why did God call him to serve? Stephen uniquely fills a gap between the apostles and the early church, between Peter's testimony bringing the gospel to the Jews And then later, Paul, or as written here, Saul, because this is before he's saved, his testimony would be brought to the Gentiles. Stephen is this bridge. He was chosen by the apostles to take on this task because he was a Greek-speaking Jew, okay? So a Hellenist is what it's called. And he could advocate for the Hellenist widows who were the ones who were being left behind. He could uniquely speak life to those people, literally having a translation barrier, okay? And then also because of his cultural experience. Stephen spoke to a unique group of people and he didn't minister to the Israeli Jews and he didn't minister to the foreign Gentiles. He ministered to the foreign Jew. Those that he intimately identified with. He served them and he performed miracles for them in their community. He was also very young in his faith, okay? We're talking like very early on in the Christian, uh, in in the creation of the church. And although he obviously very well knew the Old Testament as he wrote an entire uh, message on it, but he was a Jewish because he was a Jewish himself. But we're talking like months, maybe year or so after Jesus's ascension, making Stephen a really young Christian, He hadn't been doing this for years. He hadn't been walking alongside the apostles for years. He didn't walk along Jesus' side for years as he was on the earth. He was a believer who wholeheartedly served Jesus, making him relatable to those that he was ministering to, to those who were now at the beginning of the church seeking and professing Jesus as Lord and Messiah. And so while it's cool that we look at all these things that like Stephen fits this very unique role, the story still seems like really mournful, right? Like I literally get choked up reading it. And as we read, there's really no indication that anyone was saved by this event. It's not like God came down and intervened like um, Jesus did with the woman at the well and prevented the stoning It's not like all of a sudden everyone just professes Christ. His sermon doesn't work and he professes, all of them profess Christ as their savior. So it seems like there's this element of eternity missing that we know also common throughout the word of God. But there's proof of God's hand and his eternal plan in Stephen's death, even if it didn't come in the form of salvation from the Jews that were stoning him. He fills the gap between the gospel presentation to the Jews and its presentation to the Gentiles by being the catalyst of the dispersion of the church. So at the very end of what we read, chapter eight, a great wave of persecution began that day and all believers besides the apostles were scattered and preached the good news wherever they went. Because of this event and Stephen's servitude, we get this mass exodus of believers. This caused Saul, the one in the story, to persecute Christians to an even greater extent. As it said, he went above and beyond (laughs) to kill Christians. And then it leads to God blinding him on the road to Damascus and intervening in Saul's life And then Paul begins to preach the gospel to Gentiles. And the gospel travels everywhere, crossing land and sea, and yes, coming to me and you, making its way all the way around the world. And the church today greatly exists due to a man who was called to service. 
and his sacrifice. So out of a man's yes to service birthed a worldwide gospel movement. And all he did was say yes to working in a meals ministry. So we talk all the time at Encounter and at Celebration as a whole about the importance of serving, okay? We talk about that all the time. And we talk about how critical it is for the health of the church, both as a whole and here. It's important that we not merely be a consumer of faith, but that we actually live in action the faith that fills us. So this testimony of Stephen highlights why our service is so critical to the evangelistic mission of the church. Because here in this space, people witness faith in the gospel up close and personal in ways that uniquely look like you, in experiences that you have uniquely lived, and in ways that only God knows the burdens of your heart that he has fixed worked on, healed. People witness faith up close in a service environment. So how can we be like Stephen? What made Stephen such a great servant that his life led to all this? So three things to identify Stephen by. Number one was that he was filled with faith in the Holy Spirit. That's what they write at the very beginning in verse 5. Stephen is the only one that something is added extra next to his name, even though the very next section of this scripture is a whole story about Philip and him running along the chariot and then jumping in and talking about God, okay? So it's not like he's the only one who was written about in the Bible even. Other men had glorious stories of God working through them. But Stephen's the only one who has this nice little additive that says that he was filled with faith in the Holy Spirit. So what does that even mean? We talk about walking by faith and being filled with faith like all the time. But what does that even mean? To be filled with something, you're dominated and you're controlled by that thing. If you're filled with anger, guess what's dominating your actions? Okay, if you're filled with joy, guess what's dominating your actions? So his faith is what dominated and controlled his life. It was all consuming. And that's what you read in chapter seven. And like I said, I don't have time to read it all, but please, please, please go read it. Okay, because it's super, super good. Okay, if you read it, you will find what Stephen believed. You will find what his faith was in. He placed his faith in the authenticity and the validity of the Old Testament, that God's hand was over all of history, that it wasn't some mistake, and that it's all pointing to our Savior. It's all a witness of God's purpose and his plan. He believed firmly in the God that's revealed in the Old Testament. In chapter 7, verse 52, he also proclaims and places his faith in the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, differing from those who were currently accusing him because they did not believe in the deity of Christ. He believed that Jesus not only died, but was raised again from the dead when he states in 55 that he sees the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand, declaring him just as equal with God, just as Jesus said he was during his time on earth. He believed that the Messiah cared for him and that he was there waiting to receive him. He was controlled by what he believed in his life, his thought, his ministry, his responses, and his emotion, all controlled by faith. He had given his life completely over to God in whom he believed. So his occupation and his title was truly secondary to the faith that he lived by daily. So are you filled with faith? Is it what drives your every moment and your desires and your work and your emotions? Do you have a firm faith and grasp on who God is and all of his promises and the gospel in and of itself? That feels like a lot, okay? But as believers, it's important that we know what we believe, And that we're confident that God really is who he says he is. And that he will provide and fulfill his promises. 
So number two is that he was willing. Verse eight, Stephen was, uh, chapter six, verse eight, I should say. Stephen performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. He was willing to do anything. We see all these miraculous signs that Stephen did, and we're like, hmm, this was a great man. And yet all that he was asked to do was to serve. Seemed lame. But out of his service came the greatest boom in church history, spreading the gospel. So Stephen was not complacent in his, in his functional ministry. He was willing to do anything because it was there among the people that he worked. He seized opportunities and allowed God to work through him, meeting people right where they were, performing signs and miracles to all the people around him for the glory of God. So where are you? What's your sphere? What's your influence? If you're in serve team, you're really annoyed with me right now because that's all we talk about. How can you impact those around you even if it's in your job or your role that seems too functional to be able to possibly have an an impact for Christ. God is just as powerful in a functional environment as he is in a spiritual one. Number three is that he was filled with grace. Chapter seven, verse 59, Stephen mirrors Jesus' final moments on the cross that we just talked about last weekend and asks God to forgive those who persecute him. In our service to one another, we need grace. In our evangelism and our testimony, we need grace. For those that are blind to God's redeeming love, because we too were once running from God's provision. And then another moment of of God's grace through Stephen is verse 15 in chapter 6. Stephen stood in front of his accusers and those lying about him and his character And he reflected the glory of God back unto them. Do we do the same? Even in the small things, I fail to be gracious. And I pray that we would all grow in our desire to be gracious. I don't always believe that we want to be. And that we would seek opportunities to be gracious with others. So, last couple thoughts. I challenge you with this. God's still looking. He's still looking for people who resemble Stephen's character, who are full of faith and willingness and grace, and who are willing to serve his church and represent him in the world. This is what we do. This is church. The church has an evangelistic mission, And it is placed here so that believers can gather and be equipped and be energized and be empowered and then they can be sent out to go and proclaim the gospel to all who will listen, no matter where they are, no matter where they find themselves on a a Monday at noon. God's right there willing and ready. So where are you called to serve? Is it here? Is it in a kid's ministry? Is it on campus? Is it in the dorms? Is it on your team? Is it right here at Encounter with Serve Team? Where's God asking you to be willing to be filled and controlled by faith? Are we willing to sacrifice our time in order to serve so that someone might be saved? We are confident as a church that God has a mission not inside the walls, not just inside the walls of a church, but for the world. Answering the call of service could be the trigger that sparks an evangelistic movement in your environment. And all we have to do is walk by faith. So what's keeping you? Ask God. Okay, I'm gonna pray and close us out. Lord, thank you for this evening and just a moment to witness and to read and to share in the life of Stephen. And I pray that all of us would be able to see you in new light in our lives. 
willing and ready to walk with us wherever we are, to share the gospel wherever we are, to serve and be up close and intimate and personal, to be the hands and feet of you to those around us, all just for the chance that people might get a glimpse of you and your glory. And I pray that um, this would not just be something we hear, Lord, but it would be something that you keep placed on our hearts and that you would bring it, up, bring it up to us in moments throughout our days where we say, this is a moment where I can serve. This is an area that I can serve. This is what I have been uniquely equipped to do. I pray that you would empower us and Lord, that you would cast out any doubt and fear that that is not true. Lord, thank you for those gathered today and I pray um, that we would be loving to one another in the way that you are to us. In your name I pray, amen.